learning and the knowledge sharing should not stop and uh, we all uh, in our country we are seeing that you know lot of uh, doctors are sharing their views and we are very fortunate that uh, we have uh, today with uh, dr ashish kai a very eminent uh, ivf specialist uh, from pune very a uh, known personality from here uh, all over india and inter internationally also it's a it's a privilege to have you here sir uh, just to say a few words about dr ashish kali he is the founder and uh, director and chief consultant at asha kiran hospital and asha ivf center pune he has conducted many clinical studies and has been faculty at various national and international conferences he is ex vice president pogs and he is ex he was executive mcn at isar msr and ih uh, it's it's a privilege to have you here sir uh, just a request to all the participants uh, uh, if you have any questions during the session or after the session i request you to put the question in the q and a box which is at the bottom of the zoom app and if you have any problem in audio video slides you can put it in the chat so if you have any medical questions please i request you to put in the q and a and i assure you that we will take up all the questions at the end of the sessions thank you so much and over to you dr ashish yeah thank you uh, thank you for that introduction and i am at the outset i am really thankful to the team uh, of yours who make it uh, feasible in this particular scenario so nothing to uh, like we are really in a in a middle of a of a war and we are fighting against uh, the uh, enemy which is not uh, visualized to all of us so uh, coming down to the today's lecture we are be talking about the stimulation protocol in iui uh, being this is uh, what i ga gather the any successful art consultant is the successful consultant means that you know the endocrinology very well you should be stimulating the patients without causing any side effect to the patients like uh, control over in hyper stimulations or maybe a multifetal pregnancy you cannot make a patients that uh, untowards incidence of having nicus admissions like being a art consultant it's not not good that you should only make them a multifetal pregnancies the patients positive with the pregnancy test or the patients coming down to you with the triplets it's not our aim our aim is to have a single uh, fetus with a single pregnancy go till the 9 months 9 days that is our aim our aim is not to have just a pregnancy test positive we we are now changing from pregnancy test positive to um, very well uh, things that uh, take home baby rates so coming down to the my topic of uh, stimulation protocols in iui this has been already been uh, uh, what you call as uh, been uh, discussed in my group that is the facebook group but still uh, there are uh, many request from my friends and my colleagues that i should be doing it again and uh, the opportunity given by the samarth pharma i am thankful to them also so the why we need to, to do uh, some stimulations first of all we need to understand to stimulation is not something that one need to just keep on doing it it's what we need to understand is the stimulation is going to aim to have a good quality of the oocytes we should be able to know in getting the good number of oocytes which is required for the fertilization uh, uh, of that oocytes correlation of the mild endogenous hormonal dysfunctions are there so we need to understand even if there is we are going to stimulate the patient for iui there are the patients which will come back to us with the hyperprolactinemia there are the patients who will come come down to us with the thyroid dysfunctions so there are certain uh, uh, what you call as a subtle dis disturbances in the hormonal functions that has to be corrected when you talking about stimulation for the patient as all of us are knowing the stimulations are required for the major category of the patients are are having ovulatory disorders and that accounts for the 18 to 25% of the infertility so when you are you are talking about the infertility patients it co counts to the um, to the tune of to the tune of 18 to 25% so these are the patients you have to target upon and you have to only not going to talk about the stimulation protocols for that matter only giving a clomiphene citrate or giving a letrozole you should be talking about a certain that is a subtle uh, this thing 
uh, hormonal dysfunctions like a thyroid dysfunctions or maybe a prolactin dysfunctions that has to be addressed as far as the stimulation protocol is considered i hope i am audible okay. yes sir yes sir so the what is the effect of it the effect of it that we should not want the discordant follicles the follicles which is a smaller in size we don't want uh, like uh, one follicle is a bigger and another follicle is a smaller we don't want that things to happen we want all the follicles to increase in a size we want uh, we don't want a discrepancy into that we don't want the stimulation effect on the endometrium like when you are giving certain drugs that will cause the effect on the endometrium as well as the, on the implantation so we are are definitely clear about when you are talking about a stimulation protocols we are definitely uh, uh, thinking into account that the stimulation protocols are are the best protocol for the patient which will not having having the effect on the endometrium which will not have the effect on the implantation but in the same uh, side we will going to have a dominant follicle maybe a one or maybe a three follicles so we don't want a discordant growth of the follicles we want a uniform growth of the follicles we don't want multifetal pregnancies we don't want multifetal or multifetal pregnancies in order to give a um, nicu's admissions so uh, coming down to the basics of ovulatory disorders we all of us are knowing the ovulatory disorders may be a um, uh, coming down to the uh, ovulatory dysfunctions or maybe in unexplained the majority of the patients when you talked about unexplained infertility when you are just take the detailed history of the patients you need to invest some time in taking the histories histories in 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 order to have what are her menstrual cycles whether the menstrual cycles were regular whether they are in uh, irregular menstrual cycles whether she has has a, like a spotting in between the menstruation whether she has that particular pain uh, during the uh, ovulation or whether the menstrual cycles are irregular whether there is a scanty flow that has to taken into account because when you are taking a good history that will uh, segregate the patients into two group the one group may be ovulatory patients another group may be a uh, anovulatory patients the ovulatory patients may be unexplained infertility so the stimulation protocol for unexplained infertility may be a totally different the stimulation protocol for anovulatory patients where you find out there is a uh, irregular uh, menstruations there is a unpredictable uh, dates of the cycles where your stimulation protocols are definitely a different so coming down to the first group of anovulatory uh, patients where according to the who we di divide the groups into four groups the first group is a hypo hypo patients where the both if, if you do a day 2 fsh and day 2 estradiol both of them are on the lower side if you are doing a um, uh, day 2 estimations then the second who group and anovulatory dysfunctions will be a normal gonadotropic normal estrogenic patients where the fsh and the e2 may be a normal but in subset of this group that is a uh, group 2 of a who anovulatory dysfunctions where you will have increased lh which is mainly the Uh, a majority of the patients mainly seen in a pcos patients group and the third group of of anovulatory patients is a hypergonadotropic anovulation where you will see the fsh will be on a higher side and if you do a image on in this patients you will have the image will be on a lesser side so you have a, a group of one group one which is hypo hypo group two a normal gonadotropic normal estrogen patients group three may be hypergonadotropic anovulation where fsh is high and your amh is low you have a fourth group of who uh, which will tell you the group 4 is usually because of a hyperprolactinemic patients where the prolactin levels which is on the higher side so when you are talking about a uh, anovulatory group of patients you need to understand you can take the patient's history the patients usually has the irregular periods the patients usually have unpredictable cycles then you group the patients according to the uh, day 2 hormones whether the patient is a normal estrogenic whether the patient is hypo hypo or whether the patient is hypergonadotropic anovulation or maybe because of the prolactin dysfunctions and the majority of the another group will remains the where the patients usually have the regular menstrual cycles they will have no obvious reasons as far as the infertility is considered 
they are called as unexplained infertility and this patient the simulation protocols will be different so coming down to the what is the incidence if you uh, group the patients into uh, uh, anovulatory disorders and ovulatory disorders in anovulatory disorders what are the incidence the majority of the anovulations will accounts for 40% of the pcos 30 to 50% are unexplained or subfertile group which is the majority of the group that's why i initially divided the group or divide the patients into two uh, cycles maybe anovulatory or maybe a o ovulatory patients ovulatory patients are a 50% of the populations they are coming into a ovulatory or unexplained infertility 1 to 2% may have hypo hypo or 1 to 3% they comes into a group 3 where the amh is less and fsh is high so coming down to the basic things of before going into the details of any ovulation stimulation protocols the stimulation protocols is depend upon the basic theory which is there in the ovaries the ovary has a, a particular theory of two gonadotropin two cell two gonadotropin theory all of us are knowing there are the two cells the first cell is called as granulosa cells and the another cell is a theca cell in ovaries the granulosa cells are sensitive to the fsh and they have fsh receptors so which are you are giving the fsh will act on this granulosa cells and this is usually responsible for the recruitment of the follicle please uh, have this queries or get the things are cleared because this is the main uh, what you call as a main thing to understand about any stimulation protocol maybe it's iui or maybe it is ivf protocol you need to understand this theory the theory means there is the two cells are there the first cell is a granulosa cells which will uh, predominantly acts on the fsh receptors are there and the fsh will act on these granulosa cells and these are responsible for the recruitment of the follicles that we called as antral follicle or the croat of the follicles the second cell in the ovary is a, called as a theca cell the theca cell has a lh receptors and that will play a lh receptors going to have the functionality of the lh receptor is the growth of the follicle and the maturation of the follicle so those patients who are going to have the recruitment of the follicles these recruited follicles will later on have this lh uh, receptors which is responsible for this growth of the follicles and the maturation of the follicles so these are the particular uh, uh, draw a uh, drawing which will tell you the initial there is a recruitment and after there is a cyclic recruitment this uh, uh, this follicle will have the lh receptors and these lh receptors are then responsible for the growth of the follicle and the dominance of the follicle and that's why when you are going to stimulate the patients you will need to have uh, come into the mind there is called as a initial they will give a fsh and later on they will add lh in a infertility patients or those who are going for ivf stimulation so in ivf stimulations where there is we are talking about pof or poor ovarian response we usually give the hmg usually we add on a lh that is a recombinant lh in later half of the cycle because we wanted to get more dominant follicles for our maturity to attend and to get a good oocyte as far as the ivf is considered but when you are talking about just a stimulation for iui we must know how the follicles are going to get recruited how the follicles are going to get dominant and in that factors this particular two cell to gonadotropin theory has a role to play secondly when you are talking about this particular uh, slide we must know what is the fsh threshold and what is the fsh window and what is the lh window see for all of us to just to understand the stimulation protocol the fsh threshold is like like a level after this level if your drug is going to hit or your level is going to increase about that threshold the follicles will going to get recruitment is much more so if your fsh threshold is the drug which is been given which will once it crosses the fsh threshold then your follicle recruitment going to get start and the fsh window is like a longer the window if you have broader window you will have more follicles which is going to get recruited you have a lesser fsh window you have monofollicular development this is a very basic of any stimulation protocol so the basic of a stimulation protocol is depending upon your fsh threshold so that you will drug has to attend or has to go beyond that level to cause recruitment of the follicle 
if you wish to have a more window uh, to get opened or the bigger FSH window, you will land up into multifollicular development. If you have a lesser window, then you will have a, a single follicular development, which is going to happen. So I think up till now, I'm very much clear about a two cell two gonadotropin theory. I'm very much clear about what actually the window is and what is the FSS threshold. So as far as the uh, uh, consideration of the stimulation protocol is considered, when you are going to have a stimulation protocol for IUI, the one thing is this particular slide is going to tell you about the FSS threshold. And if the FSS threshold is not been achieved, what will happen to the rest of the follicle? The rest of the follicle is if your FSS threshold is not received or not there, then the automatically the rest of the follicle is going to have the atresia. So we'll not have uh, co-dominant follicles, will not become uh, mature follicles. So this is the basic thing when you're talking about any protocol for that matter, IVF for that matter, IUI is considered. Okay, so these are the particular thing when you're talking about the FSS threshold, there is called as a rescue or there is called as a, a, a window of the FSH and then there is a called as a, a downfall where you will, if your FSH threshold is not been met, automatically these are all the things are going to have atletic follicles. <clears throat> so we come down to the next of it, how you will decide the protocols for the patient. The decision of the protocols is not all sides fit the one. We have all the individuals are different. All our our uh, economic, what you call as a bio texture is different. We come from Asian population. My, my, many of the friends are there from, from European uh, sites. They have different mechanism because they have different uh, AMH, they have different FSH, they have different BMI. So the any of the individuals are different. So we have different or individualist strategy for stimulation protocol. Similarly, the thing uh, when we are talking about stimulation protocol, it has to be based upon the age of the patient. What is the basal AMH? What is anteral follicle? What is the A, uh, what is the AFC? If you do a, you wish to do a stimulation protocol, you need to do a day two scan. The day two scan is important because when you are doing a day two scan, you need to find out is there is any residual cyst? Is there is a corpus luteum which has already been there? or there is a just a simple cyst has been uh, found out or on a day two scan, what is the AFC, what is the endometrium, whether the endometrium is shedding or what is the any other uh, uterine pathology which has been documented. You can definitely take in care when you do a, done a day two scan. So day two scan has its own importance because whenever you are doing a day two scan, you will find out what is the AFC, what is the uterus, whether it is acutely antiverted, it is retroverted, or is there is any pathology like there is a tubo over in mass or uh, what the endometrium is behaving. So when you are deciding the protocols for stimulation for IUI, the thing is that you have to take care of a BMI of the patient. If the patient is obese, the same dose is not going to give you the best result. If you are going to give the same clomiphene cited dose, which will not going to uh, act on the patient and you will not have the recruitment of the follicle. So the BMI also plays the important role as far as the stimulation protocol is considered. Then coming down to uh, the something uh, related to the AMH. What do you call as the AMH? When it is a low AMH, when it is normal AMH, when it is high AMH. The high AMH is uh, usually seen in a polycystic ovaries. We have AMH which is more than 3.5. So in those patients, when you are doing with the stimulation protocols, you need to understand these are the patients which will going to go into over uh, stimulation or these are the patients which will require initial dose is on a lesser side rather than going a higher dose for those patients. So similarly, when you are to uh, talking to the normal patients, you can do a fixed dose depending upon the BMI of the patients. You can titrate the dose of gonadotropins. I'll come down to that in a little while. So coming down to the first drug, when you're talking about the clomiphene citrate, the, all of us are using it nationally, internationally, maybe it's a different pathy. All of us are using the, the drug. The drug name is a clomiphene citrate, which is the first synthesized in 1956. The commercial uh, trial has been done in 1960. So it is not something new. It is well um, documented drug, well tested, it is time tested. Uh, the side effects has been documented. 
as far as the pregnancy and take home baby rate as well as the abnormalities in the babies uh, that has already been documented as far as the clomiphene citrate is taken into account all of us are knowing the clomiphene citrate has a estrogenic and anti estrogenic action 85% of the drug is eliminated within the one week why it is important to know how much is the drug is going to get accumulated uh, inside the circulation because many of the time when you give a clomiphene citrate to the patient half of the uh, time the patient is not conceived in the same cycle and the patient is taken a gap of a one month you will find out the patient will come down to you a second month missed period coming down to the pregnancy test positive that is nothing to do with uh, with the god is there or something like that it is the residual effect of the drug that is the clomiphene citrate which will be having the prolonged effect in the body the elimination of the clomiphene citrate it takes a longer time to drug to get eliminated the uh, increment of the dose is required in the obese patient you can start the clomiphene citrate uh, for uh, to the tune of 50 mg and then you can keep on increasing the dose of a clomiphene citrate from 50 mg the maximum dose is 200 mg so after the 200 mg if you are not receiving the proper uh, uh, what do you call as a growth of the follicle or if you are not she is not conceiving that is called as a clomiphene failure then you need to think in a different way what exactly strategy you need to account for then secondly what is the ovulation rate if you are giving the patient with the clomiphene citrate it with the 50 mg or a lower dose if you go to the literature the you will find out that the lesser dose will be much more effective as far as the ovulation is considered the ovulation is much more when uh, the 50 or 100 clomiphene mg uh, mg of clomiphene citrate is been used the ovulation rate is 52% but if you are increase the dose for the same patient your ovulation rate is going to have only to the tune of 22% coming down to the uh, what ovulation if you are not having uh, uh, what you call as a tvs in your hand or maybe a ls surge in your hand what you will do the thing is that in those patients you need to understand that the ovulation will going to happen after a 5 to 12th day from the last dose so those are the other pathies which are going are usually given the clomiphene citrate for 5 days they to, they usually advocate the patient to have the intercourse after 7 days or after 5 days seeing that keeping in mind that the ovulation is going to happen after 5 to 12 days after the last dose but this is not the ideal practice to be done ideal practice to be done is like you had need to give the clomiphene citrate you need to go for the transvaginal scan to know how the follicle is behaving and you need to understand the color doppler as well as the ultrasonographic role for documentation of the ovulation coming down to the uh, i will not go into the details about the receptors level of the clomiphene citrate but just to summarize when you're talking about the clomiphene citrate you need to give a clomiphene citrate from 50 mg if there is no ovulation is documented you can increase to the 100 mg if you are the same thing is happen you need to increase the dose to the 150 mg what is the resistance like when you are giving the patient of a uh, patient of a clomiphene citrate 150 mg uh, per day for 5 days and she is not going to show any ovulation that means she is resistance to the clomiphene citrate the clomiphene failure means you are given the patient the clomiphene citrate tablets and she is going to get ovulated but still she is not conceived that means that she is a clomiphene failure patient so these are the particular things when you are are talking about the clomiphene citrate so the clomiphene citrate then there is a many of the questions will come the clomiphene citrate we get the thin endometrium what will happen see in iui the thin endometrium per se has no role because when the clomiphene citrate is given we know the clomiphene citrate has anti estrogenic action on the endometrium and for that matter on the cervical mucus so when you are giving a clomiphene citrate this clomiphene citrate has anti estrogenic action so you will have that thin endometrium you should not be worried about the thin endometrium when you are giving a clomiphene citrate for that matter so this is uh, what i was talking about the clomiphene failure and clomiphene resistance the clomiphene resistance is usually accounts to the tune of 20% and mainly this clomiphene resistance 
and can be accounted by giving additional drug like uh, you can add a metformin for that matter then you can uh, if that uh, not going to uh, solve the problem you can always have the letrozole or gonadotropin so i'll come down to that i'll coming down to the how uh, we give a clomiphenicitate as a stimulation protocol for iui so uh, only the one thing and the, about the clomiphenicitate is a multifetal pregnancies nowadays being a ivf specialist or being a infertility specialist we don't want a multifetal pregnancies and that's why the iui is not that much is rewarded procedure because if you compare the ivf procedures and multifetal pregnancies and the iui and multifetal pregnancy the more of the studies you will see that the iui when they are conceived the chances of multifetal pregnancies is much more on a higher side okay so uh, now we will be talking about something like a insulin resistance in pcos insulin resistance in a pcos is is one of the factors that has to be taken into account when you are talking about stimulation protocol because when you are are just seeing the patient of a pcos and the pcos patients they are not some of the patients or some category of the patient which will not going to have a good uh, results with the clomiphenicitate or resistance to the clomiphenicitate then in those patients you need to know a certainly uh, called as a insulin resistance and that can be uh, be calculated by doing a homa index or maybe a, a insulin free insulin levels uh, or or doing a certain uh, in that particular things are so coming down to the uh, to the meta analysis whether the metformin should be added or whether the metformin should not be added see whenever you are talking about a pcos that is a, a group 2 of who where you are are going to have the lh on a higher side and anovulatory patients and in those subset of the patients where there is a insulin sensitive insulin resistance is on a higher side in those patients metformin is only been added to give a benefits for the pregnancy rates but mind well even if you see the cochrane meta analysis the cochrane meta analysis does not support the routine adequacy of using a metformin as far as the live birth rate is considered so coming down to the next drug what we have we are ha going to have the next drug is aromatase inhibitor that there is a, a temporary decrease in estrogen levels which will cause a increase in fsh so there there is a uh, letrozole is usually acts as a, a aromatase inhibitor this aromatase inhibitor blocks the conversion of of this um, um, androgen to the estrogen and this negative uh, feedback will cause more secretion of the fsh this fsh will acts on the on the uh, on the granulosa cells to stimulate the follicular growth the studies shows that the pregnancy rates with aromatase inhibitors are similar to the clomiphenicitate but when you are talking about the uh, group 2 of who where you will definitely see in who2 type 2 group in a pcos all of the literature like ishre or maybe asra they will tell you that the drug of choice for a pcos the first line of treatment is a letrozole and not the clomiphenicitate we uh, need to understand again the fss threshold and the window if i am giving the drug if i am giving the drug for a longer time i'll make the fsh window open for a prolonged time so there is if i wish to have a monofollicular development i'll give the drug of that is a letrozole for that matter clomiphenicitate for 5 days if i wish to open the window for a longer time then i wish to give a extended protocol for that matter clomiphenicitate or for that matter letrozole for 10 days the same dose a 2.5 mg 2.5 mg can be given for 10 days we are increasing the uh, the length or window of the fsh uh, doing that we are going to increase uh, the multi uh, follicular or follicular recruitment and and saying that we are going to have multi follicular development so whenever you are talking about letrozole letrozole can be given 2.5 mg once a day for 5 days when you are talking about a uh, single follicular development or when you are talking about multifollicular development you can give a 
extended protocol or you can give a step up protocol the step up protocol is like this on day 2 you start with a one tablet of letrozole on day 3 you give two tablets on day 4 you give a three tablets of letrozole and day 5 you give a four tablets of letrozole and that means you are going to have a step up of a dose what this will cause this will going to have a multi follicular development because this will open up the window of the fsh and more follicles are going to get recruited and once the dominant follicle is going to be our leading follicle in a oral ovulations i wish to give or there are the literature which will tell you when you are going to give a trigger the trigger has to be given when the size is between 20 to 22 so uh, by this we come to know what is exactly the points to know about as far as the letrozole is consider because letrozole is is a better drug when we are talking about a side effects because letrozole doesn't have anti estrogenic effect on the endometrium or for that matter will give a multi follicular development when you are doing a letrozole in a step up protocol or extended protocol if you are comparing a clomiphene citrate for that matter a letrozole definitely you will have a mono follicular development as far as the letrozole is considered so the letrozole can be given in a clomiphene resistant patients in those you can definitely uh, add up a letrozole with the gonadotropins or maybe a purely letrozole which are uh, way you can go with so this is the something about the letrozole extended protocol what i was talking about you can give a letrozole uh, to the uh, 2.5 mg once a day for 10 days and see whether the mono follicular development is there or not and once the follicle is going to develop for 18 mm dominant follicle or more than that you can definitely give it ovulation trigger then coming down to the gonadotropins all hot topic of the gonadotropins the dose of gonadotropin Uh, then we can talk about whether the gonadotropin should be given continuously or maybe interrupted whether the hmg should be given or recombinant fsh which is the best so one uh, must understand the gonadotropins in iui has a role in a selective patients what i mean by the selective patients the patients already been tried on a clomiphene citrate they are coming into anovulatory patients or those who are clomiphene citrate resistance patients or maybe a, a cc failure patients or in those patients who already we started with the letrozole multi follicular development has already been achieved or step up protocols and those patients are failed to conceive definitely i will be talking about gonadotropins in those patients similarly if you are going into hypo hypo patients that are hypo hypo patients where the fsh is low lh is low so definitely in those patients i will be happy to start gonadotropins directly then i'll come down to the the majority of the questions that is going to ask the gonadotropins which gonadotropins whether i should be using hmg whether i should be using rfsh or there are the preparations in the market like a, a hp highly purified the dose whether i should be started with the 75 international units 150 37.5 or 112 so what is the appropriate dose when as far as the gonadotropins are considered see these are the basic things will depending upon upon the dose is also depending upon and that's why uh, starting this lecture i told you that you should do a day to scan the day to scan will tell you how much are the antral follicles are there what the follicles can be recruited in this cycle depending upon that i can monitor my cycles of gonadotropins also i can monitor my cycles with the step up protocol of the letrozole or maybe i can manipulate my cycles with stair step protocol of clomiphene citrate or bmc protocol uh, whatever protocol you wanted to name as similarly when you doing a day two scan you will come to know what is the fc if the fc is normal i will i'll happy to go with the with the normal dose of maybe a 75 international units of hmg or i will be if the a previous response is not there majority of us are now start with 112 units of uh, hmg or maybe a rfsh because nowadays we have the hmg multi dose is also available so definitely you can tighter the dose as far as the hmg is considered again the fcs are is very much poor i'll start with the higher dose i'll not start with the same dose 
I will start with the 150 of the HMG or maybe a, a 300 depending upon the AFC or depending upon the image of the patient. Uh, definitely, I will not go with the higher dose because there is always chance of OHSS and that is difficult to manage as far as the IUI is considered. So coming down to the, to the basic things, whether I should be using uh, recombinant FSH or the HMG, there are the beautiful trial that is called as a Megaset trial. And this is a randomized, blind, multicentric clinical trial, which will definitely focus on the HMG and FSH, whether the HMG gives a better results or whether the recombinant FSH gives give the better results in the IVF and the ICSI cycles in antagonist and, and what they found out that if you go through this slide particularly uh, with details of this particular megaset trial, they will tell you the results are as, as far as the HMG and the recombinant FSH is considered is at par. But when you're talking about the same things, because the megaset trial is been done in IVF or ICSI patient. When you are doing this particular trial in IUI patients, the cost effectiveness is also the point to be taken into account. So I'm just giving this reference in order to know the results are not going to change because when you are doing the trial in IVF patients, we know the quality of the oocyte, we know the fertilization, we know the how much oocytes have been retrieved. And so that's why this is the one of the trial we can take as a as a model or I can uh, ideal trial to compare the drug between the HMG and our uh, FSH. So these are the trial which will tell us uh, the FSH and the HMG has the similar success rate. There is nothing called as a different success rate. What is the conclusion of this trial of a megaset trial? In the predictive of high responders, the HMG is associated with the comparable pregnancy uh, outcomes and the HMG is can be a given appropriate uh, line of a treatment. Coming down to the IUI, whether the IUI is more effective as far as the IUI is considered, whether I should be adding a clomiphene citrate with the HMG or I should just give a clomiphene citrate in a anovulatory patient. I'm talking about here a group of a patient where they are anovulatory patients or those come in a PCO group. So definitely when you are adding a FSH, to the clomiphene citrate, it favors your take-home baby rates or the pregnancy rates, which is on a higher side. So whenever you wish to have uh, protocols which will give us a higher pregnancy rate is the clomiphene citrate with the gonotropins or maybe for that matter, a letrozole. They compare the clomiphene citrate with HMG as a letrozole with HMG or a FSH. The higher success rate is been documented with letrozole and gonotropin group. So this is the particular protocol that I was talking about is that there are the two protocols as far as the IUI is considered. We have a, a conventional protocol and then there is a low dose protocol, a step up or step down protocol. The conventional protocol, what is the basic thing of the protocol is like whenever you are talking about a conventional protocol, you can give a same dose for 14 days. You need to give a daily dose of injections for 14 days. After the 14 days, just do a transvaginal scan you will come to know if the follicle is less than 10 millimeter, you can increase the dose, maybe at 25 international units or maybe at 37.5. They found out that increment by the 50% dose uh, is better uh, for output uh, as far as the ovulation induction is considered or as far as the stimulation protocol is considered. So when you are starting with the, with the fixed protocol, what we do in our practice as far as the IUI and gonadotropin is considered, we give 112 international units of HMG or maybe a FSH for seven days. After the seven days, what we do, we just do a transvaginal scan. We know how much follicles is recruited. If the growth is satisfactory, what is satisfactory is the growth of the follicle is more than 10. Then after two days, all of us are knowing the ovulation or, or formation of a dominant follicle is a dynamic procedure. It has to two millimeter per day. So if after let's say four days, after a two days, you, uh, you call the patient and the patient shows from 10 millimeter to 14 millimeter, it means that the follicle is recruited and showing the good growth. But after, if the follicle is not showing the good growth, then you can increase the dose. You can increase the dose by the 50% or you can increase by uh, 37.5. But in our practice, we increase the dose. What is the initial dose is, the, is 
uh, one one two, then we'll increase the half of the dose and we'll continue for seven days and till the uh, the follicle becomes dominant. So this is uh, something what we are doing. We are start with the starting the dose, maybe a seventy five international dose for fourteen days. This is a conventional protocol. And after fourteen days, they do a scan. If there is no growth, increase the dose by fifty percent. And at the time when that single dominant follicle is eighteen millimeter, you can give a recombinant uh, SCG as a trigger, maybe a two fifty, or you can give a five thousand international units of urinary SCG. Both of them are equal as far as the IUI success rate is considered. Coming down to the some of the protocols like a step down protocol. The step down protocol, what I was talking about, you can, if the follicle is, you can give a starting dose of 112.5 for seven days. Maybe after four to five days, you just do a scan, and if you see the follicle is good growing, then you step down the dose because we don't want too much of follicles. We don't want hyperstimulation, so we step down by a 37.5. and then we decrease the again after 4 days so this is a step down protocol where you can give initial higher dose and then you can come down to the lower dose after every 4 days so what is the best things the another thing that usually asked me in a many of the conferences or many of our group also if we wish to give a single dose there are are, are multiple studies uh, there is called as a, uh, a stimulation protocol by bn chakravarti Where sir has given a HMG on day three and day six, giving HMG on day three of with the clofen citrate, thinking that when you are started with the clofen citrate hundred milligram, and if you are given a HMG one fifty on day three, that will increase the window and that will increase the uh, recruitment of the follicles. The follicle cohort is going to get recruited, and when you are giving the clo. another dose of gonadotropins on day 6 that which are follicle is recruited can be again given the hmg on day 6 that will gives a stimulation for those follicles which is already been recruited there are different protocols as far as the clofen citrate and gonadotropin is considered you can give a clofen citrate any day between day 2 to day 5 i am repeating again you can give a clofen citrate any period from day to two day five of your menstruation cycle day and then after you see the response of the follicles maybe on day 8 or day 7 if you start the clofen citrate from day 3 you do a scan on day 8 if you think the follicle is not growing good you can give a single dose of hmg 150 on day 9 and still you can call the patient on day 11 see again whether the follicle is increasing or not you can again given a one for dose of gonadotropin hmg for that matter there is another called as a pre treatment clofen citrate what is a pre treatment see the pre pre treatment um, clofen citrate is been advocated in those patients especially in pcos thin pcos where you can see uh, the endometrial lining is very less so what you can give you can give a non ethysterone uh, like a withdrawal bleeding for 5 days once you start uh, stop the dose of uh, non ethysterone uh, and then you can immediately from that day you can give a clofen citrate for 5 days you can give a clofen citrate 100 mg from the day you stop the non ethysterone and till the day patient has uh, has a bleeding your clofen citrate is would have been act on the uh, on the follicular phase because all of us are knowing there are the waves of the follicles the follicles is not only in the follicular phase the follicles can be recruited in the luteal phase also there are the different follicular waves which comes in the pa single patient in the same cycle so if you are giving a withdrawal bleeding to the patient and in the same luteal phase if you start if you if you start the same uh, same dose of a clofen citrate immediately after that then definitely uh, you will recruit it to the follicles and you will not have anti estrogenic effect of the clofen by that time the endometrium is taken over you have the beautiful endometrium which has been formed secondly what you can give uh, the you can give the gonadotropins from day 3 to day 7 that is 150 international units and and then you can see for the follicles which has been recruited 
then there is another protocol where you can give hmg to the load side you can give the hmg 75 international units from day 3 to day 7 and then you can give a clomiphene citrate 50 mg three times a day the giving clomiphene citrate later half of the cycle is to have a prevention of a premature ls surge so these are the novel protocol when you are thinking of of not adding antagonist to that cycle you can give the hmg in the initial days then you can add up the clomiphene citrate in order to have that things under control so the prevention of the ls surge can be taken care by this protocol giving the gonadotropins in early follicular phase and later on you can add the clomiphene citrate in a tedious fashion or three times a day or definitely you can do a addition of the antagonist so there are the particularly when you are giving the gonadotropins maybe a 75 or 150 international units from day 2 and once the dominant follicles reaches to the uh, 14 mm that is usually what we do, do in ivf patients but when you are talking about iui you can wait one day more also till the dominant follicles becomes 15 or maybe 15 to 16 then you can give a one dose or two dose maximum is required as far as the antagonist is considered then after the uh, dose of antagonist is been administered you just follow to do a follicular study once the dominant follicle is attained its maturity of 18 to 20 mm you can start giving a trigger along with the antagonist so this is called as a antagonist cycle of ovarian stimulation so these are the particular rcds of antagonist giving with the with the fsh iui and fsh alone with the antagonist they they favors uh, antagonist protocol when you are talking about the clofen uh, uh, talking about a uh, gonadotropin stimulations in a uh, anovulatory patients so these are the th certain groups of the patient i talked about i, I thought i am talking for one hour now so the uh, part of which is remain is a part of a uh, unexplained infertility so in an unexplained infertility everything is normal her menstrual cycle is normal uh, her periods are normal she is uh, any other reason is not been documented what is the ideal protocol whether i should be adding a gonadotropin will be helpful for this patient then the answer will come this is a, just recently they advocated in the cochrane also these are the evidence in 2020 a uh, one month back in unexplained infertility there is no role of addition of gonadotropins it is better that you just do a cc cycles with iui and in unexplained infertility if that is working it is better that you add a clofen citrate and do iui if that is not working better not to add a gonadotropins into that because addition of the gonadotropins uh, in unexplained infertility will not helpful for the pregnancy rates will not helpful for the ongoing pregnancy rates it is better to shift those patients for ivf protocols so these are the things that needs to understand as far as uh, the stimulation protocols is consider you need to understand what is the cost effectiveness anti estrogen is appears to be cost effective as far as the iui is consider as compared to the gonad uh, gonadotropins so our first line of a treatment is to start the clomiphene citrate first after the clomiphene citrate if it is not been documented at the good pregnancy or good ovulation you can start with the letrozole if you compare the letrozole and the cc with gonadotropins letrozole with gonadotropins is a better rather than the clomiphene citrate gonadotropins gonadotropins can be used on daily basis or can be used in subset of the patient can be used interruptedly like on day 9 or day 11 or maybe a day 3 and day 6 there is a beautiful uh, presentation by bn chakravarty sir which will tell us on day 3 and day 6 importance of gonadotropin in addition to the clomiphene citrate or if you wish to give a continuous dose of gonadotropins it is better to go with the low dose protocol or because i will not advocate a conventional protocol because it's a time consuming it takes 14 days continuous injections then the it is depending upon tolerability of the patient so better to go for a low dose protocol initially majority of the indian uh, population good uh, shows a good response when you are giving 112 uh, international units of gonadotropins then you can do a step up or step down depending upon the follicular response then you can add a uh, uh, anti uh, antagonist but depending upon the choice of the patient 
so it is always uh, better to add a antagonist in a certain patients when they have the history of premature lh or those patients or in those those patients where uh, sorry for that particular just a minute i'll be back for those patients where there uh, there is a possibility of uh, of having a premature ls surge or those patients where you are just uh, doing uh, uh, follicular studies and and the follicle is vanished in the middle uh, then in those patients antagonist addition is helpful but not routinely advocated antagonist protocols for iui it is better to give the option to the patients depending upon the upon the previous response you can uh, modify your uh, stimulation protocols so thank you thank you all of us all of you that who are attending this webinar and uh, as far as this uh, uh, facebook live also so do uh, if there is any queries any questions i'm happy to answer all of them on this platform thank you uh, thank you so much sir uh, thank you for having such a wonderful session uh, there are a few questions uh, from our participants uh the first question is uh, from uh, dr alwan uh so they are asking some time during ovulation induction they get the dominant follicle that is 17 mm on cycle day 8 and it happen with generally with cc or letrozole so what to do in this case uh, on cycle on cycle day 8 what eight, day 8 yeah so they get they get the dominant follicle on cycle day 8 and it generally happens with cc or letrozole so what yeah. to do in this case see uh, it, it is it is nothing like that the dominant follicle will because whenever you are talking about ivf also the follicular phase is not the fixed one so if you get the dominant follicle you need to uh, pay a little bit attention on the endometrium also if the endometrium is too poor then uh, triggering this particular follicle will not venture into the pregnancies because it's a too much higher dose what we are initiated so in the next cycle even if she ovulated in this cycle in next cycle we need to tighter the dose of the clomiphene it means that you are given the clomiphene cited on a higher dose the next question is from uh, doc, uh, dr niranjana uh, how can we improve the thin endometrium thin endometrium in iui has no role as such because if uh, you think uh, the endometrium which is less than 6 then definitely there is a pregnancy rate which is in the literature shows it is a lower pregnancy rate any endometrium above 5.6 or 6 will not label in the iui cycle as a thin endometrium but if you are giving a clomiphene citrate think that it is a dose of a of a clomiphene citrate that is acting on the endometrium and that is the effectiveness of that clomiphene citrate and this effect will go eventually after the ovulation or after this drug is going to get uh, washed out from the uh, body but if you are thinking that it is a persistent thin endometrium we are after giving a letros or for that matter then you need to think about there is a causative factors like endometritis you have to think that in that particular line of a treatment uh, the next question is from dr preeti uh, how to prepare endometrium in hypo hypo cases and stimulation for protocol for the same hypo hypo patients it means that you are dealing with the patients who are having a low fsh and low lh ratios in those patients it is definitely you need to uh, go for iui uh, stimulation protocols with gonadotropins and uh, thinking that when you are adding a gonadotropins uh, to the stimulation protocol usually thin endometrium is not accountable because hmg and this lh has uh, has a effect on the endometrium also the endometrium will grow but if eventually you find out the endometrium is not growing it is better to give um, uh, ethylene estradiol or ethylene valerate uh, Uh, estrogen valerate for that matter uh, there is a question from dr alji sam uh, if you find a cervical erosion while doing iui uh, should we cancel it cervical erosion for iui as per se nothing to do with the success rate because what you are doing we are inserting the freshly prepared semen uh, sample uh, above the internal os so cervical erosion per se doesn't have any effect for that matter okay uh, dr samir want to add uh, dr samir says that you you have said that uh, to increase the fsh window and to decide the mono or multi follicular development 
one has to increase the days of stimulation from 5 to 10 and he is saying i always thought it is usually only 5 days but it is day 2 to day 6 for monofollicular and day 5 to day 9 for multifollicular and he wants your opinion on this yeah uh, nice question samit basically uh, when you need to understand uh, the basic theory or basic endocrinology of this particular uh, two follicles or or follicular window or fsh window and and the stimulation See, mind well, you have FSH threshold. That drug has to act and has to grow the FSH levels inside the circulation so that your follicle is recruiting. You need to have a window which is morely open so that more and more FSH will act on the FSH receptor so that the multiple follicles will be going to get recruited. If your window is a smaller one and you are just reaching the threshold, it means that it will act on the single recruited follicle and you will have a monofollicular development. If your window is more and your drug is above the threshold level, that threshold will act on the cord of the follicle and multifollicular development is, is recruited. So answering your uh, query, whether we should give a dose from, it is a prolonged dose. We require prolonged dose rather than a, uh, starting a dose of day five. Even if you start, uh, clomiphene cited there is called as a uh, stair or uh, step protocol stair step protocol in spiroff if you go through the spiroff they said that if you given a clomiphene citrate for five days you uh, are not having after five days see that you are started from day two for five days means that your clomiphene citrate is going to end on day eight and after that is the, there is no follicle is recruited you can wait for five days and you after that also you can increase the dose to 100 that means that the follicle, uh, follicular phase is a dynamic. You cannot just be dogmatic that your follicle has to have uh, 14 days only. It is nothing like that. So it depends upon the prolongation of the cycles. It depends upon how prolonged you are giving. the. That's why it is extended protocols comes into um, our knowledge. Extended protocol is not that we are increasing the dose. We are, are keeping the dose same, but for the 10 days in normal responder patients. But if you are going to the hypo hypo patient, we increase the dose and increase the window. Okay, I hope I, I am clear with uh, that particular uh, question. Uh, there is one more question from uh, one doctor. He is asking, especially in mild endometriosis cases, is there any role of uh, combining diprogesterone along with clomiphene or letrozole? Yeah, I think it's it's a beautiful uh, question. See, the diadrogesterone come into market is for uh, the treatment of endometriosis. So there are the many literature which will, uh, if you go into the basic, the diadrogesterone is a beautiful drug as far as the endometriosis treatment is considered. The diadrogesterone is continuously been given and they, even if you are given a diadrogesterone, they found out there is a spontaneous conception has been occurred. So there is nothing like a diadrogesterone you given and, and she's anovulatory. It has never happened in, the, in, in that cycle. So if there is a mild endometriosis, if you give a diadrogesterone, she is going to, uh, her, has her own ovulation. In the similar way, she will have the effect of the diadrogesterone on the endometriosis also. So the dual effect can be achieved by the diadrogesterone. Uh, Dr. Vasu, Vasuda wants to ask, is there any particular dosage of gonadotropin or nitrosol for low AMH cases? Uh, is that the do dosage of goratropins? Uh, okay. Or, yeah. all, uh, low AMH. See, Vasudha, low AMH, uh, it means that uh, it's uh, patients are coming down to you. Uh, low AMH has a two. Uh, now, if you go to another group, the Posidian criteria, there are the group one, group two, group three, uh, and group four. I'm not going into the detail of Posidian criteria here, but there are young patients having low AMH, older patients having a low AMH, where we know the response is low because the age is again the considering factor. In those patients, it is better that we should start with the higher gonadotropins, thinking that we know the response will be a lesser one. So in a younger patient with a low AMH, it is better to give a clomiphene cited or letrozole with gonadotropins. But in the older patients with the same low AMH, it is always better to give a higher dose of gonadotropins directly instead of giving a letrozole or a clomiphene cited. Uh, Dr. Namita want to ask, uh, this is about I think step up protocol. Uh, so you have uh, told about the step up protocol, but she is uh, arguing that uh, to get the multifollicular development, 
wouldn't let us all step the step down protocol be better than step up see namita a step down protocol is uh, as far as the literature is considered no one is talked about they only talked about a step up protocol uh, uh, talking about the step up protocol is one that the, once the fsh threshold is been achieved if you given a dose as well as the drug on a higher side the drug will act on the recruited follicles and the another drug will uh, will be taken the dose which is increased will be taken up for the fsh window to get open so that is the explanation when you are talking about multi follicular development in letrozol because letrozol is eventually find out to be drug for mono follicular development it is not come into the market for multi follicular development okay. again another question from dr namita would antac pro is better for multi follicular development a multi follicular yeah, if if previous history of the patient is saying that there is a premature ls surge you have done the follicular study and follicle disappear during the uh, follicular uh, metry then definitely those are the patients where you can uh, think of giving a antac protocol thinking that you can suppress that uh, like premature ls surge uh well dr momita want to ask in iui of unexplained infertility can we start cc in the latter part of the follicular cycle to suppress the lh surge yeah that's that's what i i mentioned about uh, in my presentation you can give a gonadotropin initially and then you can give a clonopin cyclic 50 mg thrice a day to prevention of lh uh dr ajay want to say is there any addition addition of uh, estrogen be useful for thin endometrium because many people are doing that uh, i didn't get to get the question uh, may uh, there are estrogen uh, some doctors are using for if there is a thin endometrium mm -hmm. so is there any role of uh, estrogen see when you are uh, it's depend upon which drug you are giving if you are giving a i am very categorically saying it if you are giving a clonopin cyclic it has its mechanism of action on the endometrium so when you are giving a clonopin cyclic and you find out it is a thin endometrium it is not actually thin endometrium it is a drug that makes the endometrium thin so if you are giving a uh, uh, letrozole and found out that there is a endometrium which is thin then you need to think about whether the cause of a thin endometrium is because of the infective in india we have come across tuberculosis which is much more common we can think about what is the vascularity what is the pattern of the endometrium only just the thin endometrium doesn't mean anything it's a pattern it's a vascularity that makes uh, our architecture nowadays what they talked about what is the ratio of a hypodense and hyperechoic uh, endometrium that has all the things taken into account uh dr pachi uh, wants uh, please explain about uh, dual iui that is pre and post ovulation and uh, she wants to explanation about dual trigger oh yeah so first of all dual uh, or double iui is not advocated anywhere it is a single time iui the best time is to be done 42 hours after the trigger okay or maybe 36 to 42 hours two times iui only been done where you are getting a small volume of a semen sample or there is a sub male factor infertility where you can uh, try for double insemination now at times there is a beautiful paper in 2017 which will quote you there is called as a subsequent pulling of the semen sample you ask the patient to give as much as semen sample they want then you can make a two allocates and do a double time as iui okay another question was uh, uh dual trigger dual trigger dual trigger in iui uh, there is a two or three papers which will tell you giving a dual trigger for that matter dual trigger has to be only been according to me should be a uh, last resort when you are talking about gonadotropin stimulation where you need to have all of us are doing ivf we know a dual trigger which will gives a much more m2 oocytes so thinking like that if you are having a multi follicular development you can think of giving a dual trigger but not a uh, usual usual scenario not at all uh, dr prakash i think sir has explained the role of estradiol uh, his another question is what is the role of sildenafil citrate sildenafil citrate is a better drug when it has to be given there are the two routes which is advocated is a vaginal or maybe a sublingual they come up with the strips uh, which is dissolved in the tongue but uh, depending upon the vascularity of the endometrium you need to take a call of giving uh, this particular uh, drug 
because if the vascularity is good we are not thinking of giving like sildenafil usually sildenafil has to be given 25 mg thrice a day Uh, sir, many doctors are asking, uh, what is the ideal trigger dose? Is it five thousand or ten thousand of mcg? It is. If you are asking me theoretically, it is a six thousand five hundred international units. But uh, but if you are talking about five thousand and ten thousand, five thousand is better, not ten uh, thousand. And recombinant mcg is two thousand five hundred. Uh, doctor we not want to ask uh, what is the dose of antagonist in case of premature ill search uh okay what's the name of the doctor okay okay uh, uh, sir so so ask there is a there is a called as a, as a single dose or multiple dose single dose 3 mg you can give a cetrolix or 0.25 daily till uh, the your mature follicles is 18 to 20 mm it's a daily dose 0.25 Or if you wanted to give a single dose, is three milligram. Uh, Doctor Palu uh, wants uh, what are the different cement preparation techniques and uh, where, where they can find the details about it. Uh, what what cement preparation? Uh, cement yeah, my talk was about a stimulation protocol. <laughs> cement preparation is depend upon total mortal count. If TMC is very poor or very bad sample with a high percentage, it is better to give a density gradient. If it is a uh, good sample, it is always a swim up method. Okay, uh, sir, that was the last question uh, from the audience. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. <laughs> yeah. Sir, so, sir, what's up, man? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for uh, explaining the protocol so nicely. And I think we had uh, taken more than around twenty questions for, from the participants. So it's really nice of you uh, for answering those questions. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of some of the sciences. and thank you all the delegates who have attended uh, this session thank you so much okay thank you thank you sir thank you ajay ji thanks thank for you, uh, this particular interaction uh, hope i i i am uh, i answer all the queries what yes. uh, all my colleagues are having it's yes, a sir. really nice to interact with all of you thank you thank you sir thank you so much you give us your valuable time to us thank you, thank you so much sir okay. thank you Have a good day, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. We are discussing. Thank you, sir, from the entire Eugenic and Summer team. Thank you so much.